Habs lose into Toronto. <laughs> no, Habs lose in Toronto to the Leafs, but they battled up until the very last second. We'll talk about that also. Are they missing that third guy? The, one of the guys that they have is he the next one to hit 50? Who's the better scorer? Our guest played with one of them, who's the best player in the National Hockey League. We'll talk about all this and so much more Habs talk on Brunching with Marinero, the sick podcast, coming up with Mike Ribeiro. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero. The Sickest Montreal Canadiens Podcast. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadiens win the Stanley Cup. Sports entertainment like no other. Brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. And welcome on this Sunday morning. It's Brunching with Marinero. We usually talk with Stu Cowan, but today he's joined us before on the Sick Podcast, and he joins us this morning or this afternoon, I should say, because it is 1233. We start a little bit later than usual. Usually we start at around 1130, but right now, 1233 Eastern Time is 1133 a.m. Nashville time. Mike Ribeiro, good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. We made you sleep in a little bit. I'm doing it at 12.30 for you, by the way. Or else <laughs> I would have you. done it at 11.30. Well, sleeping is my favorite hobby right now, so. Oh, really, <laughs> eh? Yeah, you're lucky I'm up at this time. So what have you uh, What have you been doing since you uh, since you retired, Mike? Uh, a lot of it is just uh, following my son. Uh, you know, travel uh, with hockey, minor hockey. And uh, it's like travel hockey here. So there's a lot of uh, all year. And right now for uh, this this month is more like spring camp. I'm uh, working. Well, I'm not working out, but I'm uh, showing my son what to do. And uh, just uh, kind of going on the ice with him two, three times a week and just doing uh, drills, uh, skating drills, uh, shooting drills, and uh, just getting ready for the next step. All right. Okay. Uh, you, hold on a second. You're telling him what to do to work out? Well, that's what I did, right? I sat on, uh, I, I sat in a room and watched my teammates work out. So I know how to do it. I just didn't do it. The last time we had you on the sick podcast, I think you said something to the effect of um, uh, when the season was over, you barely trained. So let me go through this again. Let's just say your season was over mid-April or end of April. You were off all of May. You were off all of June. You were off all of July. You spent your entire, pretty much your entire summer at the lake. You would yeah. come back by the middle of August because your your son had to go to school. And then in the middle of August, you started picking up weights. But I think you said the, the pink ones, the 2.5-pound ones, correct? Correct. I don't even know if they sell them anymore. <laughs> oh, you have some? So hold on a second. I'm, I'm looking for mine. I don't have the pink ones, but I, I, I have the black. <laughs> I showed you these before. These are five pounds, okay? Yeah. All right, so I, I'm already working out more than you ever did. All right, hold on a second. I can I see, you know, I, you, know, you don't use them often. I can see that. <laughs> no, you're right. Well, hold on a second. second. I also oh got something gosh. else. Look this at that. Like, yeah, this is dangerous right now. Uh, those, are, uh, those are 20 pounds a piece. But anyway, okay, uh, pretty cool. The Canadians were in Toronto last night, and uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, you're pretty good at this, by the way. You've been on the Sick Podcast several times. Uh, I love having you on, and uh, I think you're getting better and better. That's good. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, much better than you were uh, many, many years ago. Why don't we watch? <laughs> Je suis en compagnie du joueur du match New Face, Mike Rivero. Mike, félicitations pour cette victoire. Ça a été une victoire serrée. Vous deviez commencer à avoir des papillons dans l'estomac vers la fin du match. Oui, on avait peur vers la fin, puis euh, j'ai pris une, une punition. Le coach a eu peur. Hein? <rire> le coach et les joueurs aussi, j'imagine. Ça va bien le tournoi pour vous jusqu'à présent. Comment tu trouves ça, ton expérience? C'est extraordinaire, mais je suis venu l'année passée. On est perdu en demi-finale. J'espère de gagner le tournoi cette année. Alors, tu es habitué, toi, d'aller un petit peu plus loin dans le tournoi déjà? Oui. Comment tu trouves le calibre par rapport à l'an passé? Est-ce que c'est similaire? <rire> non, l'année passée, c'était bien plus fort que cette année. Ah oui? Oui. Qu'est-ce qu'il y avait comme différence les équipes que vous avez affrontées? Oui, elles étaient plus fortes que cette année. Alors, un bon match aujourd'hui contre les Lillinois. On va remontrer un de tes jeux, Mike. Tu pourras peut-être nous donner un commentaire si tu te souviens, là, à ce moment-là où ça s'est passé dans le match. 
Oui, mais j'ai voulu contourner le défenseur avec une passe vers la bande, par la bande. J'ai pris la, la rondelle. J'ai vu j'avais pas de chance vers le, le devant du filet. J'ai voulu faire un, 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 un arrière du filet. Là, j'ai perdu la rondelle. Puis mon, mon joueur, il a pris la rondelle. Il a fait une passe au, au 92. Puis on a, on a marqué un but. Alors, c'est un très beau but, effectivement, qui a été marqué là-dessus. Est-ce qu'on t'a donné une assistance sur ce but? Non, c'est pas sur ce but-là. Mais quand même, il y avait du bon travail. C'est toi qui as amené hey, le monde pour truth, le but. Mike, comme c'est l'habitude, on va t'offrir, comme tu es le joueur du match, un blouson à l'effigie de l'une des équipes de la Ligue nationale de hockey. C'est un blouson qui t'est offert gracieusement par New Face. On va te demander quelle équipe tu vas choisir. Euh, Toronto. Les Maple Leafs de Toronto. Il ouais. y a une raison pour ça? Non, j'ai... <laughs> tu le trouves beau. Tu le trouves beau. Alors, on va demander à M. Christian Morin, qui est directeur yeah, de la Sears Place Laurier, de t'offrir ce veston. Tu peux le montrer un petit peu. Alors, voilà, c'est un très beau veston. C'est un bon choix, Mike, vraiment. Tu es content? Oui. Ben, félicitations encore une fois. Merci. All right, OK. Hold on a second. First okay. things first. Once again, uh, where was that? That's the Pee Wee tournament in Quebec? Yeah, that was the Pee Wee. Yeah, that was the second year. OK. And the first year, you said you lost out? First year, uh, we represent the Lytic Canadians. We actually went to, like, uh, was it the Forum? We did shootouts. I get Patrick Roy and then Denis Savard, and uh, I don't remember who did uh, shootouts against our goalies. I think we were, like, 13 years old, I think, at the time. That was pretty amazing to go. Like, we did a shootout against Patrick Roy, 13, and then we went. We lost in overtime against Lytic Quebec, Lytic Nordique. And it was packed. It was like 15,000 people in there. Oh, wow. Okay. That was the year, the first year. That one now, that one that you showed was my second year, uh, Pee Wee, that I, we went. And uh, I think we lost in the semis again. And the jacket, the Toronto jacket, is because when I got in there, right, I yeah. asked, they asked me, like, which jacket do you want? And I'm like, I want a Montreal Canadian jacket. And they're like, oh, we don't have that one. They didn't oh. have they didn't have much oh, really? Canadians. Okay. So they asked me which which other one do you want? And then I, I choose Toronto. All right, okay. Uh so why'd you choose Toronto? Because they, they well no, my grandparents used to live in Toronto. So I used to go to Toronto every summer with my parents until okay. I was like 14, 15. So when they didn't have Montreal Canadian, I just chose uh Toronto. All right, okay, I got it. Okay. Uh, out of all the plays that they showed, out of all your highlights, <laughs> it's the one that you went flying, flying into the boards. You have nothing to do with the play whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. It's a couple of your teammates, one pass to the other, the other one scores. And, and that's that why was your jeux de match. I know, and that's why I told them. I was like, no, that's not the right one. Because they, <laughs> they, they told me they're going to show one clip, and then they show me a different one. So I was like, no, that's, I didn't have an assist on that one. <laughs> did, did you notice the way your name was spelled? Oh, I thought it was okay, no? I didn't yeah. check. Can we show it again? Can we show it again? Hold on a second. And we'll stop it right after they show his name. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Play it. There we go. Du match New Face, Mike Rivero. Mike, félicitations pour cette victoire. Ça a été une victoire I just read what's under. Player of the game, I think. On avait peur vers la fin, puis j'ai pris une punition. Le coach a eu peur. Le coach et les joueurs aussi, j'imagine. Ça va bien le tournoi pour vous jusqu'à présent. Comment tu trouves ça, ton expérience? C'est extraordinaire, mais je suis venu à y passer. On est perdu en demi-finale. Here we go, stop it right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they, even like the announcers everywhere I went, they, that's how they, uh, they used to say it. Like Mike Ribeiro. 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 But now they yeah. know your name, Mike. It's okay. It's okay. Now they know your name. But I have to ask you, though. That's uh, have you shaved ever since? Is that the, the stash that you have right now? Is that the same so, stash that you had since a kid or no? So I had the stash until I was like 16. Uh, hopefully, like I'm happy you didn't find the other picture of me with a stash at 16. But <clears throat> once I shaved it once, I never went back. Like even like November or something, November, they, they used yeah. to say they used to say grow your mustache, my own like no. Nah. I, I used to have the mustache when I was 12. I'm like, never again. Since I shaved it, never again. But I might I might next next show I'll have just the stash for you guys. Makes me all right. Let's talk about the game last night if we can on brunching with Marinero. We usually take a lot of questions on this show, Mike. We are live. We're live on Facebook right now at the Sick Podcast, live on Twitter at the Sick Podcast. And of course, you can also follow our Instagram account at the Sick Podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's absolutely for free. Sharing is caring. Share this video with your friends. And if you like it on all our social media apps, just comment sick this way. If you do, we know that you like it. 
Uh, so we appreciate hearing back from you. All right. Okay. Matthews uh, to Marner. Um, and then another pass. It goes back in front. It was headed towards bunting, but I think it was redirected off a Canadian. Jake Allen stretches out his left pad. The rebound's lying there. Matthews jumps into it. Suzuki's trailing Matthews. Can't get to him in time. It's one nothing for Toronto. Allen had to leave the game because he got hurt on that play. Uh, 27 seconds later, a pass goes to Austin Matthews. Mitch Marner stretches to keep himself onside. He does a wrister that a very cold Samuel Montembeau facing his first shot. I'm sure he'd like to have it back. Later on, Nylander hits a post. Caulfield is out of the box on a breakaway, and he stopped. They go to period number two with Toronto up by a score of 2 to nothing on the power play. Caulfield dives to keep it in. It goes to Suzuki, to Edmondson, and he's able to bang it home. It's 2-1. By the way, the power play had just finished at that point. Toronto responds with John Tavares with a pass shot towards the net. Jordan Harris has taken a guy out of the play, but unfortunately for Harris, it goes off his skate and in. It's 3-1 for the Leafs. And before period number two is up, Gallagher um, passes it off of a, a Toronto Maple Leaf stick. Canadians were on the power play. The power play had just ended. It goes right to Cole Caulfield, and Cole Caulfield scores his 17th in his last 27 games. Narrows the lead to 3-2. They go to period number three. Gallagher's in alone, goes to the backhand. It stopped. Nylander again off the post. 157 left in the game. The Canadians go on a power play, face off in the offensive zone. They don't pull the goalie till about a minute later or whatever it was. They never got the puck to Cole Caulfield for his one-timer. And the game is over just like that. Toronto wins by a score of 3-2. to two. They outshot the Canadians 18-8 to eight in period number one. Canadians outshot them 11-10 in period number two. They outshot the Canadians 12-7 in period number three. It was 40-26 to 26 overall. 0 for 4, the Canadians on the power play. 0 for 5, Toronto on the power play. I'll talk about the power play in just a second. But, Mike, the Canadians lost... But they battled. Yeah, I think they, uh, especially, I think, like, 2 nothing. they got that penalty, I think, 17-minute uh, or 14-minute penalty, and they were able to, like, hold them up. I think the PK uh, kind of kept them in the game. Uh, it could have been 3 nothing easy with that uh, uh, Toronto power play. but uh, uh, And they had a chance until the end. I think Gallagher got a breakaway at the end uh, uh, to, to, to have a chance to tie it. Um, uh, but if you have a chance to win or to tie at the end, I think, I think you'll take that on the road and uh, against, against Rona, that is a pretty heavy team, a uh, uh, pretty good team this year. You know, we'll, we'll talk about the lease, what Austin Matthews has been able to do. Mike, it's pretty awesome, man. 58 goals, 41 assists, 99 points. Yesterday he scored goal 50 and goal 51 in a 50 game span. I have a couple of questions regarding Austin Matthews. Number one, is he the best player in the world right now, in your opinion? Yes or no? Who? It's hard to it's hard to say. Like how? Like a season? Like same thing with McDavid. We can say they can be both the top players in the world, but then I don't think they went too far in the playoffs. So, if you had to take one on your team, right? Now, if you had to take one on your team, wow. you're building a team. You could take McDavid or you could take Matthews. Who are you taking? <laughs> I don't know. I think they. I'll take. It's a hard one. Uh, I'll probably take. Sheesh. I'll probably take McDavid. But I don't know. They're like so equal, equal that it's hard to choose one or the other. I don't know. It's, it'll be like back in the day. Say they want Crosby or Ovi. Yeah. You know. But I think they're more similar than Sydney and and and, and Ovi, right? Uh, Matthews and. Well, they're uh, both centermen, right? Centermen and. Obviously, uh, McDavid had better speed. Matthews plays a bigger game, though. More That's solid, it. right? Yeah. I more think, of a I power think, game. More power game. Uh, I don't know. That's that's a good question. That's All a good right, question okay. to ask the fans. You should ask the fans that. I don't know. I'll probably take both on my team, right? <laughs> yeah, no, you're right about that. Okay, so now um, think about this. 58 goals in 67 games. You think yeah, he's going to hit 70? Well, if he keeps going the way he is, he, I'll say 65 for sure. Yeah. But it's kind of weird that last year when they get eliminated, the first thing they said, oh, we maybe we should trade maybe Matthews and Marner. 
Uh, look at Montreal with Cofield at the beginning of the year. Keep him in Laval. And now he's like 17 goals in 12 games. And yeah, yeah, people are like, well, geez, like finally, right? Yeah. So sometimes patience is, is, is a good thing. It's, it's just weird with top players, younger players too, that patient with people just run away pretty quick. I think, like, it's, I think it's part of me. I think it's 17 and 27 for Cofield. Yeah, it was something like that. But yeah, still. 17, he had one in 30 under Ducharme. And when he did, I was one of those guys who said, send him to Laval because he wasn't on the power play anymore. He was playing 11 minutes a game. He was on the fourth line. His confidence was dipping big time. And I wanted him away from this environment. Clearly, Marty St. Louis has been a blessing yeah. for him and for his life. Gretzky's record, 50 goals in 39 games. Watching Matthews, the way he's going right now, he scored 51 in a 50-game span. He's probably not in the prime of his career yet. Mm -hmm. You think he could challenge Gretzky's 50 and 39? I think he can challenge it. Uh, doing it, ooh, I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how that. But every record is there to be beaten, right? Uh, someone's going to beat it at some point. So, uh, you I think, think Ovechkin's yeah. going to break Gretzky's eight ninety four? Oh, Ovi? Yeah, I think I think Ovi will. Wow. Oh, well, Ovi! It's like every year you're like he's not going to do it again, right? And he does it again. That guy, like the thing with Ovi is that he can stand there on the power play. He's been doing that for almost what twenty years now. Just stand there. If you watch him, he's not even moving. And he's just pounding the puck. Like, every year he's at 30, 40, 50 goals. It's like, you know, give him uh, three more years, four more years at 30, 40. He's the, like, he's going to beat it. Yeah. I think he was the number one pick overall, I think, in the 2004 draft. So, I think it's been, what, it's about 18 years that he's doing it. You're right. Mike, you played with Ovechkin. You know, and I, I know you just kind of tried to explain it right now and saying, you know what, he... He's been he's been there on the power play and he does it all the time. But the way this guy plays, that he takes hits, he dishes hits, he plays that much of an energy game. How has he been able to be this sustainable and this durable, playing like that night in, night out for eighteen years or whatever it is? How has he been able to do it, Mike? Oh, he's in good shape. He's a, he's a thick, he's a thick guy. He's not like Rip, but he's thick. He's strong. Uh, you know, he works out well, he uh, takes care of his body, does uh, he? Yeah, really, yeah, like uh, he's Russian, who knows what they put in their bodies, right? <laughs> I don't know, well, 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 I'm just saying, like, but like you said, it's not like it's not only on a power play that he just stands there, he'll yeah. go, he'll go hit someone hard. Like, I think he has one of the most hits since uh, since he started, like 4,000 hits almost now. Uh, and he's a big boy. I think he was able to stay away from injuries. He, he wasn't too injured, right, in his career. Uh, I don't know. He's, he's just he's just a monster. He's just a beast. All right. So you've seen Ovechkin shoot the, shoot the puck and score goals, and you're seeing Matthews do it right now. Obviously, Ovechkin has done it for so long. He's on the verge of, you know, uh, you yeah. know Gretzky's record, all right? He's there. He's close. He's in proximity, but... At their best, and we haven't seen Matthews at his best yet. Ovechkin or Matthews? We haven't seen Matthews at his best yet. I think Matthews is more like a skilled player, though. He has more skill than Ovi, right? Ovi is more yeah. a pound. He like, just pounds it. But uh, uh, I think Matthews, I think, is a better overall player than Ovi. I think they're just snipers. There's some guys that they're just snipers. They'll score from everywhere. You'll be like, how did he score from there? That's just, there's some guys that are like that, right? They're just, Sid, Sid is more like a two, like a dish the puck more. I think it'll be, be a better passer than those yeah. two. But there's some guys that are just snipers. Like, All right. Speaking same of thing which, with Cofield. Cofield will be the same. He's a sniper. Yeah. Well, I was just going to get to him. I was Mike, think about this. He's got 17 goals in 27 games. I think on an 82-game season, that's averaging 51.6 goals. In your opinion, is Cole Caulfield going to be the next half to hit 50? Well, right now, like the way he's playing at the end of this year, uh, you assume that he will at some point if uh, if he keeps going, if growing on that way, on that side of uh, the way he's been shooting the putt. But, uh, yeah, I think it will be probably the next one if he stays there long enough. So you and I just talked about Matthews and Ovechkin, right? And and Ovechkin, you said, is, is just like his... 
is is, is a train. A, he's a train. All right. Matthews as well is a very skilled player, but a lot a lot of power. Very very solid. Cole Caulfield is like this, and he shoots the puck as hard or almost as hard as those guys. Have you ever seen a small guy shoot the puck like Cole Caulfield? Oh, that's a good question. I've seen smaller guys. I've seen uh, the, I've seen big guys that cannot shoot. That I never understood that. But uh, small guys that can shoot. Well, that's a good question. I'll have to like look at it. I, I guess Korea had a good shot. Uh, I'll have to like look at that. But uh, yeah, he has a good release, quick release. Uh, it looks like he's like having fun. He's not like sh like you know when you see Colfield now, you're like oh, yeah. kid, kids having fun. Like I feel like that that stress, that pressure has kind of gone away a little bit. Uh, and the confidence, the game, the game is I'll say ninety percent, ninety five percent confidence. Once, once you get into your head, especially as a as a shooter, because if you don't score, then then people will be like, okay, well, what else can he give us? But they're scores. So the guy that does it as a sniper and doesn't score for five games, you'll be yeah. like, what, like, what's wrong with this kid or what's going on? Because they're snipers, right? Mike, it's funny. A couple of years ago, when Cole Caulfield was drafted. A lot of people said this guy is a he's a surefire top 10 pick because he was playing with the U.S. National Development Program. He was the best scorer coming out of the program. He was scoring at a rate that Austin Matthews used to score at, maybe even better. And um, he was a top 10 pick. And then he slipped, of course, because he was small. He's short. Mm -hmm. And so 11 goes by, 12 goes by, 13 goes by. And um, I think it was the, um, I think it was the uh, Philadelphia Flyers who had the 14th pick. <clears throat> And they go up, and I don't know if you've ever seen this footage before, but there's a bunch of Flyers fans in Philadelphia at a bar watching the draft, and they're all chanting Cole's name. Take a look at this. Who did they pick? Defenseman Cam York from the U.S. Oh. National <laughs> Development Program. You know, Mike, I love this. All right, we know that scouting is not as easy thing, but yeah. guys that are paid to do it for a living, all right, they chose to go with Cam York. A bunch of fans who are drinking beer. Likely 8.6, intense by nature, the beer for those who follow their instinct and live their passions in order to make their mark like me. They're at a sports bar. They're watching this happen. Uh, not as nice a sports bar as Lakash. That I can tell you for sure. They're, they're there. They're watching this happen. They're chanting Cole. They got it right. And the Philadelphia Flyers got it wrong. It's unbelievable. What all the respect to Cam York. I'll say it happens almost every draft, though. Yeah, you'll be like, how's that possible? We skip this guy, right? We can go back with Montreal too. You'll be like, they pick yeah. this one instead of that. That just happens all the time. And sometimes it works the opposite. You'll pick a guy that you don't think is going to come out and do it. And then he comes out and do it. You know, Mike, you know who I like asking a lot about amateur players, youth players. I like asking other amateur players, other youth players, guys that play with them and against them. I find those are, you know, those kids are the ones that usually have a fairly good read on how good a player is or isn't or what their strengths and weaknesses are. Did you have that gift or not? Like, you know, like when you were young, if I would ask you, you know, Mike, who do you think is going to play in the National Hockey League? Do you think you would have got it right more often than not or no? I think more often than not, I think you can see it. You can know, like you said, you play with those guys, you play against those guys. So uh, now that I did, at first, I didn't know how NHL worked or like what do you need to get there and stuff i was just playing but now that i play then then looking back you'll be like okay well this guy i knew this guy was going to make it 
But sometimes you're like, well, I, this guy was going to make, but he didn't know he was going to make as good. You didn't think he was going to be as good as what he became. Because a lot of some kids will like be better at 18, 19, 20 than 16, 15, 16, 17, right? Some yeah. guys will like, uh, there's guys like Jimmy Ben, I think, didn't come, like, wasn't a great player until 21, 22, 23. So it depends of the, uh, it's really like the player, uh, the, the confidence in the player. And a lot of kids will be like, oh, I didn't get drafted, I'm done. Or you can do the other, the opposite. I didn't get drafted, I'm going to work harder to get there, right? Yeah. So, but I would have been able to see, to see, I think, I think you got to wait, like, as a young, young age, because you got to wait until it starts hitting. Because a lot of kids that I grew up, like Pee Wee or at home back there, uh, squirt nowadays, you look at those kids back then, you're like, oh my gosh, this kid's going to make it. And then, yeah. well, Bantam starts and then Midget starts and then they kind of fade away because hitting. And then you're like, okay, well, the, this kid won't, won't make it. But a lot of kids when I grew up that were like sick Pee Wee. And then once it became a hitting game, yeah. then they kind of fade away, right? All right. Okay. Why don't we do this, Mike? Why don't we get to the questions? All right. Some of them will be for you. Some of them will be for me. You can pretty much ask Mike Ribeiro anything. Not well, maybe not everything, but yeah, pretty yeah, close. Yeah, He's pretty an open cool. book. He'll answer. Jeff Stahl says for Mike, can you describe the pressure of being a French Canadian player for the Habs versus playing elsewhere like Dallas? Mike, this is going to be a good one for you. Well, it depends on your character, right? Because uh, for me, playing there, I think Jose, too, like, we loved it. We loved to, like, be there. The pressure wasn't, uh, we didn't feel as much pressure. It was kind of, like, fueling for us, the pressure. And, uh, but I have to tell you, like, the difference is that you don't have to, like, after the game, start thinking, okay, what questions I'm going to have, what I'm going to answer, what am I allowed to answer or not, right? You have to be careful with your words back home. And yeah. Better not say too much. And then my first game in Dallas, I think we had one phone camera and one <laughs> the old school recorder with wow, the mic. Yeah. But we only had like one one uh one crew there compared to Montreal. Give me, give me we a had, second. Give me a second, Mike. Pardon me. Keep talking. I want to look for something. Keep answering the question. Yeah, so compared to uh Montreal that you have after the game, you have 20, 40 journalists there that you have to answer, half in French, half in English. Uh, you just have to be more aware of what to say because I really think Montreal, because of French and English, it's who's going to come with the best story, right? After a game, who's who's going to come French way or English yeah. way is going to come with the best story? Compared to Dallas, we only had one camera. And, and in the papers, we had the last bottom right in the back of the paper. You know, you have basketball, football. Football is the big in Dallas. So it it's, depends on your character. I think a lot of French kids will love to play here. I'll, I'll say you can ask most of French guys that play here will say, yeah. I think it's the assumption that it's going to be more pressure. But once you're, once you're there and you play, you play. You just have to be strong enough to understand that people, if you're not playing well, if you're not scoring, if you're not doing anything, they're going to be on you and you have to be ready for that. I don't have it handy. I was looking for it, but I and I brought this up to you, Mike, already once before. I'm sure you remember this, Mike, and we've talked about it, you and I, but the night that you were traded to Dallas for Yanni Ninema, uh, I was making my way into the building, um, and I think at the time it was called the Molson Center, I believe, and I was making my way into the building, and I got word that you had got traded, and uh, everyone was looking for you, and everyone was upstairs or around the, the press box area, or they went downstairs uh, to the hallway and stuff like that, and I said, to myself, I'm going to stay in the garage because at some point here, he has to leave the building. So I'm going to stay in the, in the garage parking lot. And I caught up with you and I, and um, it was either just me or there was someone else with me. But uh, that's the night that you said, you know, uh, to the media, you said, uh, Hey, I got a message, this kid, let Andres, leave him alone, let him be. Uh, because I felt like you felt that you had not been left alone and that people were all over you and that there was too much pressure that was put on you or too much media pressure. What was it exactly? Well, it's the, the ex expectation, right? You expect me to come from junior. and But once again, same thing with Coldfield this year. If I never played fourth line and you put me in the fourth line, it's not the same game. I won't be able to produce the same, right? It was just the expectation of me to play well and to do well without having the chance to do it. So it was kind of hard. It was kind of like confusing for me, right? 
you guys want me to be the top player, but then how am I supposed to be the top player if I'm playing the fourth line? It doesn't make it didn't make sense for me, right? Yeah. But uh so that's what you were alluding to back then. It was more so when you said leave him alone, you were talking about expectations. Well, leave him alone for uh for Guillaume was more like the first training camp, like people were chanting gi, gi, gi. Well, if if Guillaume doesn't score like he's supposed to, then then it's kind of like people be done with him, right? Yeah. Like the expectation is so high. But sometimes it takes longer for someone to get to where they're supposed to be, right? It mm -hmm. might take two, three years, depending how he's used to on the ice. Yeah. Guys that are like a junior, like Kofi, that scores all the time, or Guillaume back in the day. And then you get to the NHL and you're playing the third, fourth line. Well, then it's not the same game. You're not used to playing like uh, 12 minutes a game, right? Yeah. So it, it becomes a different game. So patient is, is most of the same thing with those kids in Toronto, right? Patient. Like this year, I'm pretty sure they're going to pass the first round, right? Yeah. You got to be patient with top players. Like people just won like right away. Like we got to win right now, right? The thing Mike. with Montreal, the thing with Montreal though, that people have to understand, there's not only six teams anymore. I yeah. understand like in the 60s, 70s, we're winning all those cups and stuff, but there's six 12 teams. You're at 32 teams with a cap salary cap that everyone's kind of equal. It's kind of harder to win, but going back to the question it was more to to be patient with the young kids and especially if they're french because uh uh people love french kids until they make money it's kind of crazy yeah like it always goes down to how much they make but it's not it's not uh, it's just the market that's just the market and that's just the way it is but you'll see like every time that a kid goes like uh not playing well is not scoring it always goes down to how much they make well Mike, sorry if, sorry if uh, price is making 10 million people are like, oh, he's making 10 million well go look around the league the top players make what all 10. yeah I 10 plus say, i think it should be if you make 100 points you get 10. if you had 90 you make 9 88 and you go down like that. If you make 50 points a year, it's five, but then go down. Mike, people have speculated in the past, but if we can, right now, right here, I want to get your take. When the Canadians traded you, I think it was a preseason game, right? Um, the yeah. season hadn't started. It was a preseason game. The year before, you had picked up 51 points. You were 25 years old. You had not yet entered the prime of your career. I think you went on to play in the National Hockey League after you were traded. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be getting this wrong, but at least another decade, right? Yeah. Five years with Dallas, and you had played with Washington and Phoenix and Nashville and all that stuff. You went on to have seasons with Dallas of 59, 83, 78, 53, 71, 63, 60. You know, you, you went on to have great seasons in the National Hockey League. Yanni Ninema, when the Canadians acquired him, was all but done. No one in the world would have made that trade if it was a hockey trade and only a hockey trade. Do you agree with that assessment? I agree. Why were you traded, Mike? Well, it started before me. They didn't like that. They, they traded Jose. They, 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 it started, they traded Jose Theodore first. Yeah. And then it was me after. I think uh, they didn't want like too much noise. That's one thing Montreal, like they don't want the media to disrupt the, the team. So any distraction outside the ring or anything, any attention that is not about hockey, they don't want that. So they what wanna... noise? What noise did you guys make, Mike? Were you guys? Well, you guys. You guys hold on, let me let me let me put it this way: the noise we made or the noise that the papers made. That's a okay, different. That's perfect. a different question. So let's go there. It was it was made to appear that you, Theodore, Dajne were the three amigos. You were buddies. You formed a clique in the locker room on the ice and off the ice. You had alienated some of your teammates and you didn't conduct yourselves as professionally as you should have off the ice and on nights before games, this, that, and all that stuff. Okay. Well, before we formed our clique, there's already cliques there. We didn't form the first clique in the Montreal Canadiens when I was there. It Koivu, was just Koivu and Rivet. And uh, I don't know, like there's other ones. Like it was like the Czechs were the Czechs, the Russians were the Russians, the English was with English, the veterans with veterans, and the French with French. That was just the way it was. Not that once we get to the ring, we talk to everyone, 
But if we were on the road and we're going for dinner, most of the time was me, Jose, uh, Pierre, and we were going for dinner. The checks would go together. Right? Like it was just, it was just normal. It was just like, but because we're French, I kind of, and like I, I put my hat today just for you guys. Okay, I put it sideways too. They're always like complaining about my hat, my dress coat, my like. But, but what is that? At? But nowadays, but wait, who, nowadays, who, who, who complained about that? What you, my hat? It was every no, uh, every interview, like the papers. Uh, okay. Every interview, like you all, oh, his hat sideways, the way he walks, the way he dresses. But now you look at kids, the way they dress, you're like, well, well, the thing I was too advanced for now. For that, uh, that, all, I, all right, okay. I had sure. my hearing, I had my hearing. I was from Montreal, but my first four or five years in Montreal, I did I, I did not made it. I, I didn't skip a curfew on the, on the road. Yes, we went for dinners and we had a good time. But if I land here in Montreal, if I land in Montreal on a Wednesday after a game at 12.30 at night, and we only play Saturday, what's wrong for me to go to the bar, though? Like, what's wrong for me if we land on a Wednesday night in Montreal at 12.30? Yeah. Okay? And we only play Saturday night. What's wrong for me to go out? I never understood that. Like, But I got in trouble for going out on a Wednesday when we only play Saturday. Did you have practice on Thursday? Yeah, that's okay. Practice on Thursday. Did it affect your practice? Did it affect your ability to, to, to perform your practice? Or is that... But then for me to go to a bar and, and uh, have a few drinks or for the guy to go home and drink a bottle of wine, what's it's just because I'm in the public eye, right? So I it, hear you, of it course. makes a, di a, like a different like vision of, of things, right? When, when you look back now, do you wish you would have stayed home and partied at home? No still would have done what you did because you wanted to live your life yeah i wanted to live though but so, with what we're like don't get me wrong on friday night before the game i didn't go out i made sure that i was home sleeping making ready that i'm ready for saturday but saturday night after the game if i play tuesday i'm going out yeah who did you go out with ribeiro and with uh with no. theodore and uh no you didn't go out with those guys not not in much at all. like rarely i was with pierre pierre used to live more in blainville with sage home Okay. And, and Tio, no, I was rarely with Jose. Summertime, once Where in a while. Where did you live? Where did you live, Mike? Uh, NDG. You lived in NDG? Yeah. You live 15 minutes away from my house in LaSalle and you never called me? Well, you're 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 not there yet. You're like two, you're like at the bottom when I started. <laughs> you and Norm, but now you're the big, you're the big dog. I knew you're you gonna make it. You know, you 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 made me uh you early on in your career, you made me laugh. You probably don't remember this. I probably shouldn't say it, but I'll say it anyway. It's funny. Uh, so you guys have a game. And at that point, um, you're, you're with your wife. I believe she was, I'm not so sure if you were married, but you were, you were together. And, um, and you introduced me to her at the, at the end of the game. Like, uh, so, you know, you come on, you said, uh, Hey, hey Tony, I want you to meet, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I said, right, nice to meet you this and that. And then you turned around and you 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 whispered in my ear and you said, "She's hot, eh?" <laughs> <laughs> I was so uncomfortable. I didn't know what to say. She was your girlfriend. She was your wife. I said, "Yeah, she's 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 very 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 attractive, Mike. She's very very nice, very very nice." But so there was you had look. I can appreciate this, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay, my son has the cap sideways backwards. Uh, my eldest, he's 19. And like you, uh, he has earrings, all right? It's the first thing he ever wanted when we said, what do you want? I think he was like 15 years old or 16 years old. And he said, uh, I like to have earrings, right? So he's got both earrings and stuff like that, all right? You had your style. But based on what you're saying, because you had the cap sideways, because you had the scruff look every now and then, because you had the earrings, some considered you a bum, a punk. Mm -hmm. But you weren't a bum or a punk. You had your style. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Yes, I was direct to the media. If I didn't like something or I will say it, right? I wasn't like the nicest one with the media. But I said what I said. I said what I thought at that moment. And I'm not a bad person, but uh, because everyone always doubted me, like, it will be kind of like hypocrite to like write something bad about me. And then the next morning, like say hi like nothing happened right so, so mike, mike you would read the papers you would listen to radio you or you had people would, telling you what was said 
Uh, not often, but you'll hear it. You'll hear it. It'll come to your ears anyway. I had people calling me on my phone telling me I had bad games and shit. Right? I had people yeah. uh, showing up at restaurants with my kids telling me, I'm like, I sucked last night, right? And that's fine because they're fans. But when it came to the media that I see them every day, and then you write something about my hat or something that I did, or then I would be like, you know what? But because I grew up with everyone doubting me since I'm a kid, uh, he won't make, he's too small. And, and those people that said that now asking me questions about, about my game, I'm like, what, you're the guy who didn't believe in me all those years and now you want to like, what do you want from me, right? So I would give you the answers straight and short. Yeah. But I grew up with this up because everyone doubted me. Everyone said, no, this kid's not fast enough. He's not strong enough. So I was like, you know what? Fuck everyone. I'm going to do it my way and it's the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep believing myself and no one's going to tell me I can't make it. And that's a little bit of a, a fuck you attitude, but I had to to make it. That's that's the way I saw it. All right, let's continue to get to more questions, and we'll get to uh, some of this stuff a little bit later on. Uh, Charles Patrick says, uh, we can feel the, the frustration and the anger still in Mike like 20 years later. Fr uh, writers today strive more uh, to sell papers, so the more controversy they spew, the better it is. Mike, who was your favorite reporter and why? Tony Marinero was the best one. <laughs> Where you worked back in the day was that nine ninety or something? Mike, was can that... I tell you something? <laughs> I, I still am. It was you. I think that I, literally you and uh, I still talk to Norm. I, Storm I, and Norman Marshall. I still talk to him because it, it was never like an attack or approach, like an aggressive approach. It was more like a talking approach. It was more like a friendly approach, asking questions, but more friendly. You and uh, still to this day, I'll text Norm or I'll send him a message. <clears throat> and Norm is like not the biggest uh, journalist out there, right? <laughs> it was just the way the conversation was not like more about putting the mic on my face. It was more about, hi, Mike, whatever. And then ask quite like, not just a journalist, but kind of like, a, yeah. You know, even now, doing your show because the back in the day right yeah and there's some guys that sometimes i'll be like eh, i'm not sure if i want to do this interview right yeah you know mike i very much appreciate the respect you had for me you know i think it was a little while ago a couple of weeks ago somebody sent when you were on the sick podcast somebody sent a comment on youtube and said hey hold on a second i heard that ribeiro can't stand you or didn't like you and i said you got the information wrong mike always had respect for me and we always got along very very well all right okay uh, and people, wait, you said before that, like, I, I, they could still hear my uh, uh, anger or something. Yeah. My anger is because I wanted to win in Montreal. I wanted to win the cup in Montreal. I was pissed to get traded. I wanted to be in Montreal and win in Montreal. And I still want to, but now you guys have a pretty good coach, so we'll see. I might have to take uh, three, four years now. I don't know, Mike, the power play struggling. I think you can help. <laughs> no, but listen, I got to tell you something. Um, I think you're a power play guru. I thought you were as a player, and I think you have a, a power play guru mind. So uh, who knows? Who I knows? Mean, yeah. Who knows? We'll see one day. I might have to start somewhere else for them to see it. But the only bad part would be you'd probably wouldn't be on the pack podcast all that much uh, going forward. But anyway, uh, I'd want it for you if that's what you want. All right, let's get back to the questions. Uh, Pasqualino Floro, with the draft being in Montreal and a top three pick, pretty much assured. What do you think the Habs will put together to make this draft one to remember? I, I think they're going to uh, use their assets. They're not going to use them all to draft. I think they're going to probably part ways with one or two to make a trade, maybe, all depending on how much they want to accelerate this rebuild. If they have the number one pick, I think they'll take Shane Wright. If they have the number two pick, I think they'll take Slavkovsky, the winger. Comment sick if you love this podcast on all social media platforms, when we read the comments sick, we know that you love it. More questions with Mike Ribeiro. Melon, is there any current Habs player that you can see plays the closest style to you? Wow. Suzuki. Suzuki, I'll say. Yeah. yeah. He has a good vision, good good passer. Mike, number one center in your book for sure, yes or no? Oh, sheesh. I, 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 you got to give it to him, I think. I think he's growing. I think he's a mature. I think he's a little bit more mature than it. But it was, you guys went to the cup with him. Like he's, he's been playing pretty good lately. He's a guy that can play both sides of the puck, even though yesterday on his back check, he let Matthew score. Yeah. But, uh, 
uh, other than that, I, I think, yeah, you got to give it to him. I think uh, I'll, I'll say number one center, yeah. All right, okay. Uh, next up, Julio Jimenez for Tony. How much will be Romanov's contract next season? $3 million per year? Yeah, I think he's going to touch at least $3 million, and he's going to be signed to a long-term deal. He's uh, really coming into his own. Next, Marco Monaco for Mike. What do you think the Habs should do with Carey Price? Would you keep him in the rebuild, or would you move him if they can? Well, you need a goal in return, right? You cannot just send him uh, send him away without uh, uh, some kind of piece back. But I think not, that, not necessarily, Mike. Not if you're rebuilding. Not necessary. Yeah, if you're not, rebuilding, you keep Allen and Montembeau. I think I would. I think I think maybe. I don't know. That's a tough question, but I think if you're going to like go to a different direction, I think you should. Uh, you can trade him for a good value right now, and get something really good in uh, in return. If you wait two years from now, I think that value is going to go down a lot more. But Mike, it looks like he's going to be back this week. We'll see. Uh, I mean, unless there's another setback. Jake Allen got hurt. Carey Price has been practicing more frequently. Those who have been watching him have been saying that he's been looking really, really good, like he's really close. They play, uh, they host the Winnipeg Jets tomorrow, then they got a good game on the road a couple of days after that, and then they play two back-to-back, -back, the Islanders on Friday, Washington on Saturday. If he doesn't think, play tomorrow versus Winnipeg here, a lot of people think he's going to play Friday when they host the Islanders. I think like it's going to be his choice, too, I think. I think he's yeah. I think. Price has a lot of power in that decision too, and uh, if his heart is his heart is still in Montreal and he still wants to win there, I think I will keep him for a few more years. But if 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 his heart's not there and he, he wants to move on to a, to a different chapter of his career, then you have to give it to the guy. Uh, you have to give that uh, uh, to Carey. I think a lot of it was going to be his decision. If I go back to your playing days, and I include now that your career is over the top five goalies that come to your head that you played against or that you're watching right now that I played against well, freaking or you played with or against top five goalies. Asik was there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, brother. brother. Yeah. Obviously brother. I did play. I think I played not even a year against Roy Patrick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who else? I'll say, uh, uh, not Osgood. I didn't like Osgood. Vasilevsky oh. now. Vaz, yeah, he's like he looks big though. I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, he's got the same well, equipment as everybody day, else. Like, Mike. We had so many good like Jiguer I played against, like uh uh Belfort was pretty good. I, like, I believe <laughs> there's so many. I believe that even though Brother and Roy had better careers, at the best of the best, at his best, Dominic Hasek was the most dominant goalie of all time. As short term as it was. I yeah, but like it's hard to compare. Same thing with like uh, Ov and uh, it's like different styles. It's kind of hard to like, but Asik was a monster. Yeah, but as a goalie, Mike, I find it's easy to take a look at. Right, the way what I look at it is who's the tougher to score on. When yeah, Asik was on was, his game, he 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 looked unbeatable. Yeah, he was like it was. Yeah. It's it's so hard to score, and that's why when those guys are scoring sniping like that, you gotta give like you gotta give props to those guys because especially nowadays goalies are huge. Goalies. Yeah. Are Technique, everything. It's kind of, it's a different time, you know. Wood sticks, do those sticks nowadays? Uh, goalies, uh, more bigger kids now. It's like go goalies they now. They're more than you used to, Mike. There you go. <laughs> goalies are like six five nowadays. Are every six five? Uh, uh, Pecky Rennie was great. Price was great when I played against. I think I score all the time against Price, but uh, oh my god, that's I'm another. tired now, Mike. Yeah, you're done. You're done. I'm tired. I, I, just. I I'm tired a, just looking at you. I, I need a snack. Hold on a second. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's my favorite. It's my favorite. That's what I ate every morning before school. Oh, right, really? Yeah. Two toes. Uh, coffee and two toes. Nutella toes. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was your... Uh... That was my breakfast, lunch, and dinner for a long time. Oh, my God, man. That's pretty funny. Hey, um... When you played for Dallas, you had a game here. My first game back. Your first game back, okay? Um, I, you went out with a buddy of mine. Buddy of ours? 
I don't know what I don't know if you want to say this, but hey, you went out with a buddy of mine, okay? I know the story. All right. You want to tell me the story? We can, tell I everyone can watch you the story. Come on. I can tell you the story. Okay, so you're playing, you're with Dallas, you're playing the Canadians. Actually, right? like I'll tell you the story before that story. Okay. So I'm good. in the, so that's when uh, my trick happened. Okay. So when I got traded, it took I think three years to come back here because of the calendar back in the day. I think Montreal yes. came Montreal came once in three years to Dallas, but I never came, right? All right. And the night before I'm supposed to come back, right? We're yeah. playing in New York and yeah. I have everything planned, right? We're coming after the game, after New York's game. I'm coming to Montreal. We're going out. Everything's planned, right? But I get my trach. So I get the stick of my throat the night before I'm supposed to come to Montreal. So I cannot fly. Well, for those who don't know the story, talk about that story first. Then, how did you get that? Uh, the stick so it was throat? actually uh, Matt Higgins that played. My, we played together in Montreal, right? Yeah. So what happened? We're uh, we're in a power play. He's on PK. He's playing for Rangers, but we're both looking at the puck over there. So we're both looking there, but we're skating coming to each other, right? But he's skating with a stick up in the air, and we're both looking. So when I turn to see him, the stick just cut. Like cuts my throat, right? Oh wow! But there's no scar on the outside. It's the inside. My larynx collapsed, so I couldn't breathe. Right? Oh my god! Did you? But think you were I was die? so pissed. I, I was not even thinking about that. I was only thinking about Montreal because I was coming back after three years. So hold when on, I got, hold on a second, when that happened, did you think you were gonna die? I couldn't breathe. Right? I don't think I was gonna die, but I I couldn't like I start spitting blood. I couldn't like so they rushed me to the hospital. And next thing I woke up with the You couldn't breathe, you were spitting blood, but you didn't think you were gonna die. No, I was still wanted to go. I still went to the bench. I wanted because we had a five on three power play. I My still wanted to go back. I, I actually went to sit on the bench to go play, uh, to go on a power play, and then I start spitting blood on the bench. And they're like, Mike, you gotta go. And then I My left. God, you you athletes are different than us, man. I had hemorrhoids once and I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> I had an ingrown toenail and I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> yeah. So in my mind, though, I only wanted to come to Montreal. It was my first time in three years. I was I, I just wanted to come. They're like, Mike, you can't fly. Like, just go to the hospital. Next thing I know, I woke up, and I think I was there for a month in New York at the hospital. So that's the story. I was so pissed I couldn't go. So the second story, we get there, right? I'm actually coming to Montreal. My first game back home, I'm like, okay, Mike, I'm going to go out for a little bit, though. Not too much, Mike. So first game back, you know, by one o'clock, one thirty, go back home. Right. Hold on a second. The game is at probably at seven o'clock at night yeah. or whatever it was. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a curfew when you're on the road with your team? You probably have like an eleven oh, yeah. curfew or something, right? Yeah. Okay. When you have curfew, people want to know this. How does it work? Like, if you go out and you wouldn't be the only one who went out, by the way. How do they know if you're back for curfew? How strict are they? Do they call the rooms? Do they knock on the doors? Do they check? Do they do anything at the National Hockey League level? They don't check. Like they, they want to. They want to make sure like you're professional and you know you have a game, right? But they'll know. I think. I think coaches and stuff will know if guys are out or not. It always comes out at some point, right? Okay. But in Montreal, I was like, there's no way I was going to stay in. I was like, first time back in four years. I'm like, no, uh, I'm going right. out. So uh, curfew is 11 p.m. You got a game the next day at 7. Perfect. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, Mike, you'll go out. Just go out for a little bit, right? You have a game tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and then one and you called a buddy of mine. Yeah. You called a buddy of mine, and you said, we're going out. Yeah. Well, we called. I called him weeks. Before. It was planned weeks before that. Okay. But I'm, so I'm he, coming. I'm coming. Come pick me up at the hotel. Okay, so he comes to pick you up at the hotel at around what time? Probably like 11. Okay, so when you're supposed to be back, he's actually coming to pick you up. Perfect. Oh, yeah. yeah, out. I'm going okay. out. There's no way they could have. Even if the coach was sitting in the lobby, I was going out. Okay. Right? I was. Uh, by then, though, I was already like, I was number one center. I was kind of like set. So it's like easier to like. Skip yeah, yeah, you were established. That's it. So I go out, I go out with him, it's one o'clock, one uh, thirty. yeah, shit. Well, you know what, let's stay out, fuck it, right? It's already like one thirty. why not stay longer? What's the, what's the difference? It's three, bars are closing, three, three thirty. You're like, okay, You're like, and my friend's like, okay, Mike, I'll drop you. I'm like, no, let's keep going, right? Let's yeah. go somewhere else. So we go somewhere okay, else. So you left that establishment, which yeah. was a club. Uh, and you let you left. It was a it was a dance club. It was a club, yeah, yeah. a bar. Okay, and you left that establishment, and you ended up at a gentleman's club. 
went to a gentleman's club. Yeah. Until I think it was like four thirty, five o'clock. Yeah. And when, when you knocked on the door, they were probably they were about to close. They're no? about to close. And, and they, kept, they, they kept, recognized you. They kept it up. We kept it open until four thirty five. Okay. And then at five o'clock, I was like, okay, I think I guess it's time for me to go uh, go to bed. I have a game later. Okay. And, and then I went to bed for a few hours. Went to morning skate. Probably talked to you guys with one eye closed. And then took a nap. And then got ready for the game. Got two goals and assists, so one goal and two assists. Hold on, hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm gonna put you on the spot now. That night you did a lot. No, yeah, like, yeah. drinking. Yeah. Just drinking. Just drinking. I never okay. did the other. I never did anything of that during the season, until uh, the second half of Phoenix year. Okay. Other than that, all my career during second the second half of Phoenix year, you touch stuff other than alcohol. That's it. Other yeah. than that, all my career, what I did, I did smoke weed all my career, but you smoked uh, weed all your career. Yeah. Uh, okay. But I never did heavy drugs when I played like this during the season. Never did. Uh, I think alcohol is worse, but uh, we can discuss that in a different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, just alcohol, just re- uh, you know, some uh, some brown alcohol. And yeah. Yeah. I had fun. Let's say I had, I had fun. Okay. All right, all right, and, 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 then, and, and the uh, next day, I think if you can say this, I don't know if it was okay. Wrong. So hold on a second. So you get home, you get back to the hotel. Probably it's about five. Yeah, five, five ish. Five, five, five thirty ish. Do you have a team meeting that day or something? Or uh, I think we had morning skate. Morning skate. Yeah, just go to morning skate. But a lot of times, morning skate was optional. Okay, so did you, did you go to the morning skate? Oh, I don't remember. Okay, so then you get to the game. I think you guys won three nothing, right? I think it's three nothing. Yeah, three nothing. All right, okay. And you scored? I think I have one goal to assist or two goals, one assist. I'm not sure. <laughs> you scored a goal, I remember that for sure. Okay, yeah. show the images. The first star. First star. <laughs> first star. <laughs> it was just I don't know. It was part of the uh, part of my system, I guess. All right, so there you have it. How do you be the first star when you're coming into Montreal? You get picked up at eleven o'clock. You go to a bar until about three o'clock. You get wasted. You go knock on the door of a gentleman's club. They recognize you. They keep it open till about five five thirty. You go back to your hotel room at five thirty. You show up to the game that night. You pick up a goal. You pick up multiple points. You're the first star in a three nothing win. There you go. There you go. Oh, I have more stories about that, but I won't. I won't uh, no, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> That'll be a different day. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, let's get to more questions. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. We'll get to a few more, and then we'll let you go on this Sunday, Mike. Uh, you've already given us more than enough of your time. Glenn Marchand, Mike, you were always one of my favorite players. I was looked at the same way, being small, but I could skate and play very well. What can you tell young players growing up to help them when people tell them you're too small, you're not going to make it? Wow. Uh, it's really like you got to blog. You got to find a way to blog those people. Like you cannot even like not just small, but just in general, people are always going to talk. Once you understand that you're never going to be able to shut up people, right? People are always going to talk shit. And if you let that stuff stick on you, then your confidence goes bad. Now you question yourself. Now you start talking bad to yourself. But if you're able to blog those people, what they say, not even here, but like I said, I play with those up. I don't want the young kids to walk like this, right? But to be uh, uh, self-love, self-understand yourself a little bit more and and really uh, trust yourself and have confidence. I think confidence is really the, uh, not cockiness. I think I was a little bit cocky too, but I think confidence is the most important. Don't let people, it's okay if they talk. It's okay. That's okay. It's don't let don't let your time don't take your time to think about those things or those people. All just right, really like on. just stay with yourself, think of yourself, trust yourself, believe in yourself. Okay, back at master control here, a couple more. Um, why do you believe Marty St. Louis, having never coached a succeeding motivating players while almost all other experienced Montreal coaches have struggled in the past? Okay, he's not like uh, I Unexperienced will be like the guy that never played in the NHL. He just comes out like he played um, 
junior A somewhere and he's a coach now. The guy played and he had to work hard. And like if he's if he's coaching now is because when he played, he listened to his coaches. He was not just there playing hockey. He understood what the coach, the systems. Uh, and he was a guy with a lot of motivation, a lot of passion for the game. For him to make it as a, like us, you need passion. You need to understand the game to be able to play at that size. Uh, uh, and especially when we started, it was six, five guys. It was big. It was, the, the league was bigger, I think. <laughs> You're going up against Eric Lindros. Yeah, it's like the, not just the, the clear. Like you can go on and on with those guys, yeah. right? It was a difference. So. So how do you, Mike Ribeiro, get the puck away from Eric Lindros? If you weren't a smart player, you're never going to be able to do okay, it. Okay, but you have to listen to your coaches. Once again, when I retire, at uh, my last year, I went to Milwaukee in the American League, okay? And Dean, he's coaching right now in Minnesota. I got there and still learned stuff. I was at the end of my career, and I still learned face-offs. I was like, oh, I never saw this face-off before, right? That's kind of like you always have to uh, keep your mind open, always learning. But you got to listen. You got to listen to what you coach because it, it, they'll give you something for your game. They'll give you something you need for your game. But you need to be there to, okay, well, this is, okay, this makes sense. I'll take that. And that's why I had a lot of good coaches since I started. Julian was a great coach. And what I took, I took a little bit of all those coaches. I learned something from all of them and, and tried to put that in my game. All right. Okay. Last one. Do you think Ronaldo has one more Euro in him or the World Cup? Is it the last dance for his Portugal? Well, I think if he wins the World Cup uh, this year, then he's, I, I think I think then he should just be done. He's been did winning. Did you see what he did yesterday, by the way? I didn't see it. His, his Manchester United team lost. He was very, very upset. He's going back to the locker room, and there are fans who are basically giving it to him and mocking him and stuff. And one fan had his phone, and then he slapped the fan's hand and and kind of bruised the fan's hand. Oh, yeah, he yeah. put on social media. The fan's f phone fell out of his hand. It dropped to the floor. Manchester United said that they were looking into it, opening up an investigation. He since went on his social media. He apologized that the emotions got the better of him, and he, had va he invited the supporter to go watch a game at Old Trafford and stuff like that. But Yeah, I think it's... Turns out the boy was aut he's, is, is autistic. The mother's not very happy. And anyways. I think he's, uh, since his move, I don't think he's, uh, it's going too well since the move to Manchester. I think he's well, going he's, back. He's going he's, back home next. He's, he's going older, to right? I mean, at one point, it's, it's, he's still an excellent player, but the law of physics at 36, 37, you know, you can't, you know. Yeah. Unless you're Ovechkin, of course. Yeah, I think he's. I think he can. I think he's gonna go back home to uh, uh, one team in Portugal or something to finish his career. Yeah, maybe Sporting, where it all started. Yeah, I think I'll so. Tell you, I'll tell you who's not gonna win the World Cup. Italy. <laughs> oh my gosh, can't believe it. But it's kind of crazy that other teams have six six losses and they're in, and then Italy oh, has man. one loss and they're they're not in. I'm so depressed. At least Canada's going. And by the way, there you go. We did better in World Cup qualifying than the states did. Huh? I know, I know. We're getting there. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'll be watching uh, the World Cup and I'll be looking forward to it. And you know, <laughs> <My goodness. laughs> I'll stop. I'll stop by. I might go to Montreal first week of May coming up. So okay, you said you're coming here for your your camp in Indy. You have a camp with uh, Pierre Dagne? Yeah, that's at the end of uh, end of July, beginning of August. But I'll come uh, probably next month to uh, start figure out like our plans for the camp and stuff. So I can All stop right. by and say hi to you. All right. Um, are we going out? I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> I don't do anything, Mike, by the way. I'm just, you know, if we go out, I'm just the looks. What can I tell you? That's it. Right. We, need, we need one of those guys, the looks. Hey, I, I, Mike, I think it's safe to say you, you're, you're an open book, which is something I really appreciate, by the way. Uh, you talked about everything that you did. Obviously, you don't encourage others to do it. But for all the young kids listening, if you want to wear your cap sideways and grow the little stash and wear your earrings, Mike's okay with that. The other stuff, yeah, don't better do if it. you don't. Yeah. Eh? yeah, don't do it. The other stuff, you don't need it. Mike, thanks, man. Have a great Sunday. Thank you. Thanks, Cheers, buddy. There you have it. Mike Ribeiro, tell your buddies about it. This podcast is sick. I'm married. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube. 
Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by 8.6, Intense by Nature.